I'll just go through what the next session is. The topic is the future of Asian regionalizing. Now, in this session, we have Mr. P. Chidambaram, former Minister for Finance, India. Mr. Chin Lee Chin, Secretary General of the Multilateral Interim Secretariat for Establishing Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Datuk Sri Abdul Wahid Omar, Minister in the Prime Minister's Department in charge of Economic Planning, Malaysia. Mr. Hiroshi Watanabe, Governor and Chief Executive Officer of Japan Bank for International Cooperation. Mr. Yu Myung Huan, Senior Advisor, Kim and Chang Law Office, and former Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Republic of Korea. Now, the moderator for this session is Ms. Hu Shu Li, Editor in Chief of Chai Sin Media. Shu Li, are you here? Okay, why don't you come up, Shu Li? And if we could have the uh, panelists up. And uh, thank you, staff of Shangri La, that was very efficient. Mr. Chidambaram, I will have you to start, okay? You have to start from this side. Okay. okay. Good morning. Good morning. How are All you? All right, then, Shuli, over to you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session. We are going to discuss the future of Asian regionalism. Each of our distinguished guests will give their perspective, perspectives on topic. We will then have Q&A session. Mr. Chidan Barrow, I would like you to start. Could you please tell us how do you feel about the future of Asian regionalism? Well, I'm confident that Asia will integrate more and Asian countries will come together. But I think there are a number of challenges. I know that we have the European Union as an example, and there are some other examples around the world, but to reach that level of integration and regional cooperation requires a great deal of work and a considerable amount of compromise. Firstly, we have challenges on infrastructure and connectivity. This is one of the least connected uh, continents in the world. The second challenge is that the countries pursue different political systems. And it's not easy to agree on issues when there are such diverse political systems. The third challenge is the countries are growing at different speeds. Uh, China uh, set a scorching pace. India grew at a very high rate for a few years, then slipped and be, be trying to recover. But there are other countries which grew at very rapid rates, but have since slowed down. And there are some countries which are growing at a very slow rate. When countries are growing at different speeds, each one then tends to look at its own self-interest. So I think there are challenges, but these challenges can be overcome by hard work, compromise, and cooperation. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Ms. Jin, as head of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, how will the AIIB work to promote Asia's development? Thank you very much. Uh, the Chinese leader, President Xi Jinping, proposed the idea of setting up an Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank when he was in Indonesia attending the APAC meeting. 
And over the last 14 months or so, uh, China and uh, all of the prospective funding members have been worked very hard to conclude negotiations on the MOU, and now the Articles Agreement negotiations are almost completed. So the idea is to promote infrastructure investment in Asia, through which Asian countries can achieve broad-based economic development, reduce poverty, improve environment, and social progress. So that is the idea. So the mandate of AIIB is to achieve broad-based economic and social development. AIIB is a bit different from the existing multilateral institutions such as the World Bank and ADB or other multilateral institutions. Uh, with regard to Asia, uh, World Bank, including certainly IFC and ADB, have done a tremendous amount of work in promoting economic development. China itself has benefited enormously from the contribution by World Bank and ADB. Now it's time for China to do something more for this region. And uh, hopefully, Chinese contribution will spill over to other regions. The difference between AIB and World Bank or ADB is that this bank focuses exclusively on infrastructure development, whereas the mandate of the World Bank and ADB are more or less on poverty reduction. So there's a great amount of complementation rather than head-on competition. So I think this bank has such a unique feature of promoting economic and social development in Asia through connectivity. I would like to highlight one point. Uh, the Chinese leader proposed the strategy of one economic belt, one silk road. Of course, AIB can finance projects in those countries on this maritime Silk Road and one economic belt. But AIIB is a multilateral development institution. It will also finance projects in countries which are not on these two roads. AIIB is a bank owned by all of the member countries, not just by China. China obviously is a leading member in AIB based on the formula of GDP. Being a leading member has two meanings. One, it's just a member, just like any others. Secondly, it's a leading member, it should do more. So leadership is not privilege. It's a responsibility, it's the obligation, it's the contribution. So I think it's very much important for us to keep in mind we are working together to create a multilateral development institution in the 21st century with the 21st governance. Why the European countries and some other countries are very much keen on joining this bank? Because over the last 14 months or so, the non-Asian countries have seen with their own eyes the democratic manner in which we have had these negotiations, and they see that we are going to put in place the governance structure, which can ensure smooth, successful operation of the AIB. We are committed to build a bank which would be lean, clean, and green. Lean, this is the, going to be a bank which will be cost-effective with the core professionals recruited from across the world. Clean, this bank would have zero tolerance for corruption. Green, this is going to promote green economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Wahang, you are the representative here for Malaysia as well as for ASEAN. So can you share your thoughts? Oh, thank you, Mr. Um, let me begin by uh, paying a tribute uh, to the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Um, now, as someone who was born in Jobaru, um, just about 30 minutes uh, from here, across the causeway, um, I was able to watch very closely how Singapore grew uh, and developed tremendously uh, over the years under the premiership of uh, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Um, and now, um, in my capacity as a minister in the Prime Minister's Department in charge of economic planning, uh, I have the privilege of uh, uh, participating in the Joint Ministerial Committee uh, for Iskandar Malaysia, uh, alongside uh, the 
Chief Minister of Johor, uh, and uh, I have um, as my counterpart Mr. Kobun Wan and Mr. Lui Tak Yu, who are both here uh, this morning, uh, to help um, improve further the collaboration between Malaysia and Singapore, in particular in the development of uh, East Kandar Malaysia. Now, I think um, all these uh, are very much as a follow through to the early policies set by uh, Prime Minister Lee. And uh, indeed, um, uh, ASEAN uh, has very much operated on the concept of a prospering Thai neighbor. Uh, Singapore had benefited tremendously from the hinterland of Malaysia and Indonesia. And uh, as Singapore is now prospered tremendously, uh, it's time for um, the other parts of uh, Malaysia, in particular East Kandar Malaysia, to benefit uh, from the uh, major investments and participation from the Singapore government as well as the Singapore private sector. I'm mindful of the time uh, in the seven minutes uh, given to me. Uh, allow me uh, to perhaps um, uh, confine my remarks to three areas, uh, one on Malaysia, secondly on ASEAN, and third to speak about the broader regional cooperation uh, and making some comments on the EIIB. Um, Beginning with Malaysia, um, I think uh, for 2014, uh, we recorded 6% growth uh, in our GDP uh, to record uh, a GDP uh, in nominal terms of 1.1 uh, trillion ringgit. Um, at the same time, uh, we are happy that our trade continued to grow by 5.9% uh, to reach 1.45 trillion ringgit, and our investments grew uh, by 4.7%. Uh, to reach um, 228 billion ringgit uh, in 2014. Now, this underscores uh, the importance of trade uh, and investments to Malaysia and uh, the other countries in this region. Now, in 2015, as we all know, the environment changed significantly. There were shifts in global growth. Um, there was a huge drop in oil prices and volatility in currency uh, and commodities uh, that has uh, necessitated uh, some adjustments and implementation of new strategies. Now, for Malaysia, in January 2015, um, uh, on 20th January, our Prime Minister articulated uh, three uh, strat broad strategies to deal with these issues. Uh, first, uh, we needed to ensure balanced, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth. Uh, second was to continue our fiscal reforms and consolidation. And third was to provide the assistance to the people and business com community uh, who were affected by the severe floods uh, that we experienced in, uh, de in December. Now, on the second part, uh, in terms of continuing with our fiscal reforms and consolidation, um, we have made uh, the necessary adjustments and we have cut down our um, expenditure uh, as necessary uh, by about five and a half uh, billion uh, ringgit. And um, we're happy to note that uh, when it comes to development expenditure, uh, that's something that we have agreed to retain at 48 and a half billion ringgit. So with that, uh, we hope to be able to uh, achieve a growth of between uh, four and a half to five and a half percent uh, this year. Now, for the medium and long term, uh, we have uh, taken steps to rebuild our human capital uh, through the national education and the higher education blueprints uh, in the economic sectors, through the services sector blueprint, and the formation of the National Export Council uh, and the physical infrastructure in the uh, logistics and trade facilitation master plan. And all these will allow the outward mobility. Uh, towards a higher, larger, uh, towards larger middle class, and uh, generate the high income for Malaysians. And uh, in the upcoming 11th Malaysia Plan that uh, we are preparing, and that will be presented to Parliament on 21st of May, uh, we will feature some of these uh, initiatives and strategies and more, uh, and with additional resources uh, allocated uh, to realise our goals. Now, um, on the second part of ASEAN, uh, while we in Malaysia re-engineer uh, our domestic economy. Uh, we will certainly build upon our existing linkages uh, among ASEAN countries. And in terms of business network, uh, trade relationships, and in terms of shared resources, uh, to further strengthen the intra-ASEAN connectivity, um, human capital mobility, and closer communications and cooperation in science and technology, industry and training, uh, as well as uh, in society and culture. Now, for us in Malaysia, we are indeed uh, excited about the prospects of the ASEAN economic community um, uh, by the end of this year, uh, and this includes the ASEAN financial and banking integration. Uh, this will act as catalysts um, for further intra-ASEAN trade and investments, and the first step has already been taken by uh, the Central Bank of Malaysia, uh, by Bank, Negara, Bank Indonesia and the Authoritas uh, Jasa Kewangan, uh, by signing a heads of agreement uh, in December 2014. Now, as a former banker, I can attest that um, central to uh, any integration would be the 
presence of uh, banks uh, across uh, the region that will help facilitate um, trade investment across the various ASEAN countries. Uh, now, I know that um, when it comes to uh, AEC, uh, we wouldn't get to 100% of the various initiatives that we set up uh, by the end of this year. But even if we get to the 85 to 90%, uh, I believe we have come a long way. And I certainly look forward to the ASEAN uh, summit um, in two weeks' time uh, to be hosted uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the third part um, is on the regional cooperation beyond ASEAN. Uh, now, as much as we intend to raise our intra-ASEAN trade from the present 24-25% levels uh, to the level achieved uh, in NAFTA at around 40%, for example, um, Malaysia and ASEAN uh, also uh, will have to look forward to the larger region-wide agreements involving other countries outside ASEAN and Asia uh, to facilitate greater market access for goods, services and skills uh, and technology um, and to increase specialization and realization of economies of scale uh, and simpler trade and investment rules and inclusion of less developed economies in the region's wider trade agreement. Now, these agreements, however, uh, must be robust um, and must be inclusive, fair, uh, as well as comprehensive. Uh, and these agreements must also recognize the unique development requirements of the individual countries where certain safeguards and policies uh, need to be in place. Uh, at the end of the day, the ultimate beneficiaries uh, must uh, be the ordinary people uh, who will be able to achieve uh, high income and fulfill their middle class goals. Uh, in this respect, uh, Malaysia, uh, we are happy that we um, are still participating in the uh, negotiations for TPP uh, and we are committed to uh, do our best uh, to iron out all these issues. Uh, obviously, there are some challenges uh, which um, I will not elaborate um, this morning, uh, but uh, I think certainly uh, the spirit and intention is actually there, uh, hopefully to come up with an agreement that um, we can accept. Now, when it comes to AIB, if I may uh, make my final uh, comments, uh, we, we certainly welcome um, the formation of uh, EIIB. Um, if you look at some of the statistics, uh, McKinsey has estimated that ASEAN alone requires some 7 trillion uh, US dollars in investments for infrastructure, housing, and commercial space. And the World Bank, I believe, uh, has come up with uh, an estimate of uh, 1 to 1.5 uh, trillion US dollars to be invested in bridges, roads, railways, and other infrastructure uh, annually uh, in the Asian region. Uh, so, AIIB uh, will certainly complement the World Bank and uh, ADB. Uh, I know there's been a lot of comments uh, made uh, about the size uh, of uh, AIIB, but if you uh, look at the, the number uh, in uh, proper perspective, uh, the World Bank, for example, has got a capital of 233 billion US dollars, uh, but only 44% of that capital was dedicated towards uh, infrastructure. Uh, in the case of ADB, uh, it's got a uh, capital of about 175 US dollars, 175 billion US dollars. Uh, about two thirds of that uh, are committed towards infrastructure. Uh, in the me. case of um, um, EIB, uh, it's got a uh, authorized capital of 100 billion US dollars and 50 billion dollars uh, per capital. But 100% of that capital uh, will be allocated towards infrastructure. Okay. So you're actually looking at uh, some 45% uh, increase in additional resources. Uh, de dedicated towards uh, infrastructure. So that's why uh, we in Malaysia, we are fully supportive of yeah. AIB and we look forward to uh, further participation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very impressive. Uh, Ms. Watanabe, are you positive about the future of Asian regionalism? What is important? What is important for a promising future? Oh, right, thank you very much. I believe anyway, the Asia should be the core of the growth in the coming few decades on that. So in that sense, we should be very much proud of our own the effort and the own the, the working to that. And also, the, in the coming days, we are going to have about five or six billion population. So we should be very much taking responsibility to the entire world to that. And the, already the Prime Minister Lee and also the previous speakers talking about we should have some more solidarity and integration, but also it should not be exclusive to other regions. We should take good responsibility to the entire world to that. I found already the many initiatives led by the Asia would be very much the responding to such kind of the demand to that. And also the, I think the, we are going to have the much more of the better coordination in the region to that. So far, I think the ASEAN is working very well, and the ASEAN Plus 3 is also working well, and also the 
the South Asian cooperation is working well to that. So sub-regional coordination and also the entire regional integration is be going to be sold in the coming days on that. And in that sense, I think that I have just the asking the two giants in India and China, you should not be self-sufficient. You should be stay in the good supply chain network in Asia. That is quite important. If the China is moving one way and then India is going to be one way, so it could be some kind of the inefficiency in the entire world the supply chain to that. Even though the, you are the, each country has the more than the one continent of population, larger than Latin America, larger than North America, larger than the European continent, but I think the, some good the integration of the India and the China into the Asian network is quite important to that. And also, the, as a whole, the Asia should have the 5 billion, 6 billion population in the world. So we should work on together to the three challenges. The first one is that we should tackle on the food shortage and water, water shortage issues do that. I think that could be very much important challenge for the mass population in the world as a Japan, as a Asia do that. And the second one is also we are going to work on how to decrease the demand. So far we are working on the how to increase the supply to match the end, increasing demand to that. But in the future we need some kind of technology to reduce the demand with the self, much more efficient energy consumption and also the resource consumption. And also even the such kind of the demand cut doesn't bring any decrease of the standard of living of people to the such kind of technology we should sold. If not, the 9 billion or 10 billion population is going to have some big burden to the world economy to that. And the last challenge is uh, uh, the, the last session we discussed on the, the future would be taken by the younger generation. But I believe in the coming days, even though the GDP is going to grow, but I think the job opportunity provided to the younger generation is getting small because the producing machine is coming and AI is working to that. And also some are the too much dependency to the industry world to that. So I think the less job opportunity would be provided to the younger generation to that. So how to encourage the service sector and how to revitalize the agriculture is big demand and the big mission for the Asian country to do that. But I think we can go together and we can overcome such kind of big challenge in the coming years to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Ms. Yu, uh, what's your perspective about the Asian regionalism? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And Chris Roa, yeah. Well, let me start with uh, ASEAN okay. and regionalism from a Korean perspective. Uh, in retrospect, uh, besides ASEAN, uh, there has been a variety of uh, initiatives for regional integration. And each of the new uh, initiatives was proposed by uh, different players with different logics and purposes. Therefore, as of today, uh, there is no uh, single uh, regional institution that currently or will uh, prospectively uh, dominate the region. It's not likely that an EU of Asia uh, will be in the offing soon, uh, mainly because of the vast different political, economic, and cultural backgrounds among the individual countries in the region. And ASEAN was also reinforced uh, with the ASEAN plus three process in 1997, uh, which included China, Japan, and Korea. And I think uh, ASEAN's great achievement uh, has been in facilitating close relationship with the major powers in Northeast Asia. However, from the early stage of East Asian regionalism, its formation was overwhelmingly influenced by Japan and China, and belatedly, the United States also showed strong interest toward the future of East Asian regionalism. In fact, the rivalry between Japan and China gave strong influence in the course of development of East Asian uh, regionalism. As a result, there appeared various uh, regional groupings uh, that included many of the non-East Asian countries in geographical terms. And Korea's active uh, participation in various groupings of the East Asian regionalism uh, coincided with the start of ASEAN plus three process and it was a direct result of the Asian financial crisis. 
as a strong uh, proponent of the idea of East Asian community, Korea proposed to form an East Asia vision group with an action plan to realize the East Asian community by 2025. However, uh, the ambitious idea uh, somewhat faded uh, with the premature start of East Asia summit in 2005, uh, which now included the United States, Russia, and India. The leaders of China, Japan, and Korea met uh, for the first time on the sidelines of the ASEAN Plus Summit in 1999, and they continued their tradition each year afterwards, thus stimulating uh, North East Asian sub-regionalism. A secretariat of Plus Three countries was established in Seoul in 2011. And such a growing uh, regionalism in North East Asia could be uh, useful for mitigating the potential negative effects of big power rivalry and competition. And what's the biggest threat to the regionalism? It's obvious the resurrection of nationalism. Uh, as Prime Minister Lee Sen Yung mentioned yesterday evening, the nationalism has both positive and negative aspect. And we should not let nationalism uh, supersede regionalism uh, by all means. But it's almost inevitable that a conflict between China and Japan will grow. The power shift in the region uh, with the rise of China and Japanese response, uh, which was called normalization of Japan, is creating tensions in the region. And it has the potential to trigger a spiral of conflict. The United States is concerned about pressures uh, relating to an existing American-led security order. But uh, the growth of regionalism, I believe, can coexist with the US-led bilateral security uh, structures in East Asia. In a longer perspective, I think regionalism will continue to thrive in East Asia because it is also a useful tool to tackle many non-traditional and functional problems such as energy security, the environment, disaster relief, and transnational crimes, etc. But the main thrust of East Asian regionalism will be an economic integration. So various regional FTAs should be integrated into a single and broad FTA, such as uh, ALSEP or EA FTA, in order to facilitate trade and investment. Interdependency among economic entities is very uh, conspicuous nowadays with the advancement of globalization. And functioning, a functioning institutional framework reflecting such interdependency will surely diffuse any security tension accordingly. Regarding TPP, China seemed to believe that it's a counterbalance act by the United States to contain China. And the US may also think that China, with ambitious launching of AIIB, gradually comes to dominate regional institutions, reducing American influence. So all in all, it is necessary to embed both the United States and China in various regional uh, groupings. Neither side should be excluded or disconnected from a variety of regional institutions. And our goal should be on open regionalism. For that, ASEAN should continue to be a focal center of ASEAN regionalism, even though a full ASEAN integration by the end of this year may remain uh, difficult. One of the ASEAN's great achievements, as I said, has been in facilitating regional relationship with the major powers, as well as with various groupings in the region. But ASEAN should not lose its cohesiveness against the big power rivalry in the region and also against uh, various competing proposals for the regional economic and political integration. Thank you very much. I'll stop you. Thank you very much, Ms. Yu. The great points. Uh, next, I will have some questions to discuss with our speakers. Since our time limitation, I hope that each of you can give me a very concise answers. Uh, Mr. Watanabe, compared to
to the regional integration process in Europe. Asian regionalism is more subject to the geopolitical factors. So to what extent do you think that Asian regionalism can escape from uh, these negative elements? Yep. Maybe all days we discuss on the how we follow the European way to that. But now we are going to have some many difficulties European countries is going to have. And also in the case of the Asia, still the, the level of the economy is quite different. And also the political regime is also very much diversified to that. So I think in this way, the, still we can focus on some economic integration first to that. And also the last session days, uh, some participants raised on the financial the integration. So I think this area, we could have some commons and issues to that. Mm -hmm. So I think that we should devote ourselves in this region, then we can, you know, in these areas, and then we can have some good basis for the future coordination to that. Mm -hmm. I think such kind of staging is very much appropriate for the in Asian economies to that. So, okay, yeah. thank you. And then Ms. Jin, uh, AIIB has had a good start. What is necessary for the long-term success? What, what, what? what is necessary for the long-term success? Oh, for the success of uh, the yeah. AIB? Yes. Um, you know, we can draw from the uh, experience of the existing MDBs, such as the World Bank, ADB, EBRD, EIB. These banks have been operating for decades, and they have gained a lot of experience in supporting the in investment uh, in the member countries. So there are so many things which we can learn from. Being a new member, we enjoy the advantage of learning from these institutions. On the other hand, as just as a biological system, you know, when the biological system you know, ages, there could be some accumulation of problems. The cholesterol level would be higher, there could be obesity, and uh, these kind of problems should be dealt with as we move forward. So we have a clean slate to build up a new bank. And we should draw from the experience. As I said, we should pick up the pluses of the exi existing institutions and avoid their minuses. So this is very much important for us to work on the basis of the giants ahead of us. But what is most crucial is to build the governance. I would say the governance of the 21st century. We should take care of the integrity, professional integrity of the institution. As I said, the top management team must be of high quality professionals. They should not be political appointees. All the way down, we should have professionals of the highest possible caliber recruited from across the world. Only with such kind of governance with very clear responsibility, divisional responsibility between the board and the management. Could we ensure the operation could be cost effective? So I think all this could uh, tell us that it is possible, it's definitely possible to build such a kind of multilateral institution and it is certainly the obligation, the duty of the member countries to monitor the operation of this institution through appropriate uh, means. So we are very much confident, thanks to support of all of the countries, uh, definitely we can build a first class uh, multilateral institution and doing business the first class way. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really very impressive. Uh, Ms. Yu, uh, you just mentioned about the open regionalism. What role might Korea play with a growing number of uh, regional economic groupings? Well, uh, let me say that uh, Korea has been a strong proponent of uh, the trilateral FTA uh, among Japan, China, and Korea. If it succeeded, I believe uh, it will expedite the economic integration of uh, East Asian countries. And Korea is uh, in a unique uh, position in the sense that uh, Korea concluded FTAs both uh, with United States and EU, and also uh, Korea concluded 
FTAs with uh, both China and India, not to mention ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So I think um, Korea can play a uh, more role in uh, promoting the economic integration in this region. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chad and Barron, how will India's new government approach to the Asian regional integration process and help with the Make India initiatives? Well, I'm glad that everybody's uh, supportive of Asian integration, but I think as a reality check, I think we should place some numbers on the table. Intra-Asian trade represents only 54% of all trade. Intra-Asian FDI is only 51%. Intra-Asian equity is only 25%. Intra-Asian debt investments is only 16%. I think we have a long way to go before we can say that there is a high degree of integration among the Asian countries. We need to set goals. We can't set too ambitious goals to be achieved in a very short period of time. We need to set goals how to increase intra-Asian trade, FDI, equity, and debt investments. At the moment, Asian integration, Asian economic integration is largely ASEAN plus three. If you take out ASEAN plus three, there is very little integration, very little regional cooperation among the Asian countries. And I confess that South Asia is among the laggards and India is in South Asia. Uh, in terms of connectivity, in terms of uh, removing tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers, in terms of infrastructure connectivity, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka are among the least connected. SARC, in fact, has not delivered what it should deliver. SAFTA has not taken off uh, since we launched it. I think there's a lot of work to be done in South Asia. India has to play a leading role. But as I said, the conflicts among South Asian countries, the different political systems followed in South Asian countries act as a barrier. We must recognize them and try to overcome these barriers. Therefore, South Asian integration, and then South Asia and Southeast Asian integration, and then intra-Asian integration, I'm afraid, uh, is a rather long road map has to be drawn up. It's not going to happen overnight, and we are not going to achieve the levels of European Union integration uh, in a short period of time. Okay, thank you, very insightful. And Ms. Wahid, ASEAN has been the driving force of East Asian regionalism. But it seems that ASEAN has like, been very struggling for various different various like, projects. So what can be done to strengthen ASEAN's uh, uh, cap uh, capacity building in regional coordination? Well, um, let me say that the ASEAN economic community is um, about uh, an, a community with uh, freer uh, trade investment, uh, freer uh, goods and services and uh, freer uh, movement of skilled labor. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, you know, we are not there yet. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can do better. Uh, let me perhaps just confine to three. Uh, I think firstly, uh, there is a need to uh, move towards greater harmonization of the various standards and rules uh, across ASEAN, uh, whether it's in aviation or in our manufacturing standards or halal uh, standards, for example, and where we can't harmonize these standards, uh, there is a need for us uh, to perhaps uh, adopt the concept of mutual recognition, and this can also apply uh, in immigration uh, that will allow uh, freer movement of people uh, across the ASEAN countries and later into the other uh, region as well. Uh, secondly, um, if we have high ambition for ASEAN, uh, we can't live with the current um, strength of the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, I think this has been discussed many times before, in, including the one uh, in uh, Davos uh, earlier this year. Um, ASEAN Secretariat will have to be uh, strengthened, uh, both in terms of um, number and quality, uh, in order to support uh, the um, ASEAN integration. And third, I think there's also a need to look for 
uh, some game changers. Uh, and one game changing initiative I would have thought would be uh, to see whether we can uh, create that uh, one uh, ASEAN time zone. Now, there are four time zones in ASEAN at this moment. Uh, GMT uh, plus six and a half uh, for Myanmar. Uh, we have uh, GMT plus seven for Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Um, and we have um, GMT plus eight uh, for Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Brunei, and the Philippines. And we have uh, GMT plus uh, nine uh, for Indonesia, Timor, uh, East Indonesia. Uh, so I suppose uh, Indonesia is unique in the sense that um, it's got the three time zones. Uh, but I think if we can actually come up with a single time zone of say GMT plus eight, uh, which is also uh, the time zone uh, with uh, Hong Kong and China, um, I think imagine you, uh, the, the attractiveness of ASEAN as a single market um, and as a single place for multinationals to operate where all the operations can operate within a single within the same time zone. Uh, I think that's tremendous. Now, the only challenge we have to live with would be uh, having sunrise uh, in Nepidor at 8 a.m. and therefore sun, uh, sunset at 8 p.m. And uh, to the very uh, extreme, uh, Ibu Mari, um, in Inusia Timo, in the city of uh, Jaipura, uh, at GMT plus it means that you have a sunrise at 5 a.m. and sunset at 5, uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, so I think these are some just, um, I, I think, uh, challenges perhaps, but I'm sure we can actually find a way how we can actually have a completely integrated region, not just ASEAN, but ASEAN plus Hong Kong plus China, and uh, who knows, maybe later Korea and Japan can join uh, that time zone as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's time for our audience. Um, please raise your hand if you have any question to our speakers. And because I want brief questions and frank answers because of time limitation. Okay, the table, table number one, yeah. Yes, my, my name is Song Min Sun. I am uh, on the advisory board of the Singapore Forum. Uh, my question is uh, uh, addressed to uh, Mr. Watanabe. Uh, when I see the present uh, settings in, in East Asia and the Pacific, uh, we see more of uh, a dichotomous uh, juxtaposition than harmonious, uh, like the case of AIIB and uh, uh, TPP and RCEP, and uh, in the case of some strategic divide in security like mi mi missile defense system. And when we see the uh, scenes of today, uh, like the uh, reclamation in South China Sea case, and some uh, uh, skirmish on the Korean Peninsula when uh, there is a, a joint military a exercise uh, between Korea and United States, North Koreans are uh, shooting missiles. This kind of uh, uh, scenes uh, can be a, a obstructing a future of uh, Asian uh, regionalism. Uh, to have this uh, dichotomous juxtaposition transformed into a more harmonious one, I think the roles of some countries uh, like Japan and Korea in Northeast Asia and some ASEAN countries and India, for example, in the South are very important. Uh, to have this kind of setting in a more harmonious uh, future of regionalism, I think, uh, uh, as I emphasize, Japan's and South Korea's role is very important, particularly in the case of Japan. But when Japan is sitting in one side of this juxtaposition, it cannot play the role in both economic and security, security terms. So I'd like to ask Mr. Watanabe, what kind of China, uh, Japan's role can we expect in the future of this healthy and prospective Asian regionalism? Thank you. Mr. Well, th th <clears throat> thank you very much for the very warming words to Japan to that. So I agree. So Japan should take very much important role in the coming Asian regionalism or Asian integration to that. So and even this many Japanese believe we are in Asia. But geographically, we are standing on the edge of the Asian continent, just island to next to you to that. So in that sense, I think the Japan should make every effort to disseminate what we are going to do in Asia, what, the, what we are going to make the contribution to the Asian integration. That is quite important. But very unfortunately, last two or three decades, we are not taking such kind of position to that. 
Of course, at the time, we are very much the advancing in the economy to that. But now the many countries are catching up our level to that. So in that sense, the Japan should make a more clear stance what we can do to the promote and contribute an Asian integration to that. So I think that is very much important to that. But also, the, I think one statement I should say, harmonious should not come first. Every difficulty we have to overcome to that. Every stable, every peaceful areas, we can make some operation. But not such kind of easy operation should not be in, in front of us to that. Anyway, first we have to create a vision, and we have to work on to that. Even any hazard, any obstruction is coming to that. That is a, the future challenge for us to that. So at least in the case of the, the maybe, maybe coming one or two decades, Japan should make some area with the financial the contribution to the region to that. So they already the, Mr. Jin has talked about the, how to create the AIIB and the, such kind of the multilateral the effort and also some public assistance is quite important. But in the world now, we have the plenty of the public, no, the, pre, the private money to that. The size of the private money is more than 10 times larger than the public assistance, the public money to that. So how to mobilize such kind of the private money into the project and into the, the development of the Asia in such kind of the areas that Japan can make some kind of a catalytic function to invite the more the private money into the region. And also they will have to encourage some kind of change of the financial system in the each country in the region to that. We have the plenty of the savings, but the savings went out to the Wall Street and the city and they came back. That was the reason why we had a very disaster, disaster situation in 1997-98 how to mobilize, how to utilize our own money in the domestic market. Such kind of the effort should be made. So in that sense, I think Japan has some kind of an advantage, at least, at least at this moment, too, that we can provide some kind of a contribution to that. So the, for example, just one minute. So the, our bank is now providing <coughs> the guarantee for the participating banks from the ASEAN, or even the Japanese local and the Australian local, to join the syndicate of the financing of the project of the infrastructure or environmental project to that. So the, each bank is somewhat cautious to make such kind of international operation to that. They need some kind of assurance. So we provided the guarantee if the, these banks join to the syndicate, we can assure you are the, the commitment to that. So such kind of the catalytic function should be sought. I think the other bank, maybe Australian, also the Korean, and also maybe Singaporean, the bank should have such kind of good operation to that, such kind of the way. So uh, at least Japan is going to make some contribution to the future integration of the Asia to that. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. So I'm, my name is Kishore Mabubani. I'm the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School. I have a question for my friend, Minister Wahid from uh, Malaysia. Because as you were saying, uh, 2015 is a very critical year for ASEAN. It's been a marathon effort to try and get the ASEAN economic community going. And as we heard from the PM yesterday, we'll get hit about 80 to 85% of our targets. The challenge for ASEAN, as I see it, is that as you are completing this marathon effort, instead of picking up pace and sprinting towards the conclusion, we seem to be slowing down as we reach the end of this marathon. And it's partly because of renewed nationalism in some ASEAN countries, including in Indonesia, as you know, that, that's happening. So from Malaysia's point of view, as the chairman of ASEAN, what can you do to persuade the other ASEAN countries not to slow down, but to start sprinting towards the finish for the ASEAN economic community? Uh, thank you. Um, now, I, I guess um, I've been following the um, AEC uh, progress um, very closely uh, from the private sector's perspective. Uh, having run uh, three organizations that were involved in uh, operations across ASEAN countries. Um, now, we had great promise um, at the start, uh, but in the last uh, few years, there's been a slight slowdown in terms of the progress. And uh, Prof Professor, uh, you're right in some ways, in the sense that there are some initiatives uh, that were uh, slowed down uh, towards um, the, the last uh, 100 meters, if you like. Uh, but um, having said that, uh, I think we uh, in ASEAN do appreciate that uh, each country may have uh, its own circumstances 
uh, and I think it is very important for us, whilst we truly uh, adhere and agree to the uh, eventual goal, uh, but uh, we need to be a little bit sensitive to the domestic issues in each country. And therefore, uh, I think uh, we have generally agreed uh, to adopt uh, that pragmatic approach uh, in the sense that for some of those initiatives where some countries felt that they were not ready, uh, we will allow those countries that were ready first uh, to actually move on uh, with that initiative and uh, allow the rest of the countries to hop on board uh, as and when they're ready. So I think this has been applied uh, in the case of uh, the uh, ASEAN exchanges, for example, uh, where uh, Malaysia, Singapore and Thailand, uh, Vietnam, um, uh, have uh, actually agreed to actually move forward first uh, with the hope that um, Indonesia will come on board uh, a bit later. Uh, obviously, without Indonesia, it is not as effective. Uh, we have many, uh, you know, some uh, ways to go, uh, but uh, my view is that the, um, let's um, move on and let's uh, encourage uh, the, the other countries to actually hop on board uh, as and when they're ready. Uh, and the same thing applies to some of the other initiatives. Uh, but I think as we move closer uh, to uh, the end of 2015, um, I know our Prime Minister is actually very uh, hopeful that we can accelerate some of these uh, final initiatives. Um, I wouldn't want to preempt him. Uh, we're only two weeks uh, before the uh, ASEAN uh, summit uh, in Kuala Lumpur on 26 and 27, uh, as well as the ASEAN retreat uh, in Langkawi uh, that will be on the 27, 28th uh, of April. Uh, so maybe if you can hang in there, Professor, for the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Okay. I'm Ronaldo Llamas, Minister for Political Affairs from the Philippines. Uh, in spite of its weaknesses, the European regionalism and the region, uh, European integration is basically based on two pillars, as a community of interest and as a community of values. I think we started very strongly as a community of interest in our own version of regionalism. But I doubt if we will be very successful without also moving towards a community of values. So. Uh, for our panelists, uh, how do you think can we, uh, I, I agree that ASEAN, Asian regionalism is a work in progress, but how can we uh, firmly, decisively move towards a community of values in terms of, example, social inclusion, women's rights, uh, ecological integrity, etc. Uh, for lack of a better example, similar to European regionalism and integration. Thank you. Uh, to, uh, <laughs> to whom? <laughs> to whom you want to raise this question, or everybody, yeah. Uh, probably, yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, you? Me? Mr. Watanabe, yes? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I already mentioned about the, some diversified <laughs> situation in Asia, so as I agree on that it's not easy. So maybe it is not the one single barrier we are seeking to that. But I think the, the more the, as the relaxed uh, manner can be also, we can find to that. As the huge spaces and so the big size of the population, we don't have any specific, very single barrier we are going to have to that. And also even in Asia, the, each neighbor country should not love each other. We can just taking some ordinary stance to the neighbors, that is quite important. We should not show any hostility to the other country to that. But I think we should not go on to the any loving each other the coming days on that. So I think some barrier, I, you, maybe some calmness and the, some of the, the cohabitance with the nature would be one of the good the barrier in the Asia to that. So in that sense, I think we can work on the environmental the preservation would be the one set of the the target we can have to that. So, but such kind of the seeking, what would be the value for the entire Asia is current mission for us to that. So I don't think any one mission would be given, one value would be given at this time to that. But such kind of discussion is going on in the process of the integration. That is my sense on that. Uh, okay. Let me just yeah. add uh, uh, yeah. my point. Uh, yes. I think um, in order to increase I mean, the I mean, consolidate 
the community of value, uh, I think uh, ASEAN mindset uh, has to permeate among the people on the street in each country. Now, my sense is that the ASEAN mindset remains only in the uh, decision makers, bureaucrats, and politicians. So the, this kind of um, uh, community of value building is very important in the future in order to achieve real integration of ASEAN itself. Thank you very much. Okay. Who else wants to add some points? Well, maybe, um, yes. if I may add, I think obviously when you talk about values, uh, there are some that are very common where we have all the uh, end goal uh, in terms of see, integrity. Uh, other parts of social inclusion, uh, we have to recognize the fact that each country uh, is starting from different uh, positions. Uh, and you must therefore allow for uh, progression um, step by step uh, towards uh, that end goal. But I think um, in the main, uh, all countries do subscribe to the concept of um, uh, inclusivity uh, and sustainability. Um, and if I may just take one example of um, women participation uh, in education, in, um, in the labor force and so on, um, and in terms of leadership too. Um, that's something which, uh, again, in the case of Malaysia, uh, I don't think we have an issue in terms of access to education. Uh, in fact, we have uh, the opposite now, in the sense that uh, the enrollment at um, universities uh, in Malaysia uh, is uh, disproportionately larger uh, among the uh, women folk, uh, meaning that uh, in some universities, uh, two-thirds uh, of the intake actually uh, from among the women uh, lady students, uh, female students, and um, only uh, about 40% or one-third uh, even uh, among the male students. So I think uh, this is something that uh, we need to address in the sense that making sure that, that everybody has got equitable opportunity uh, to participate in the education and thereafter uh, in the employment and leadership uh, later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we still have time, and that's all. Please. Do you have any questions? So, no more questions? Okay. Could I ask a question to Mr. Jin regarding uh, AIIB? Uh, I think uh, a lot of the issues were, have been discussed in many places. I just wanted to uh, hear it from the horse's mouth. Uh, <laughs> regarding, first is the issue of standards uh, of uh, the infrastructure projects, because one of the issues we face in the region is when you put the very high standards, a lot of the projects uh, in the region don't pass the test. How do we balance the standards versus we also don't want a race to the bottom? Uh, and another issue is, uh, in, in your remarks earlier, you also mentioned the importance of win-win outcome uh, for the infrastructure projects. Now, uh, the experience uh, for bilateral, invest, uh, bilateral funding of Chinese, uh, in, uh, bilateral, invest, uh, bilateral funding from China on infrastructure has been, let's say, uh, uh, rather mixed in, in various parts of the world. Uh, in terms of how much the country can benefit from the infrastructure projects and so on. So moving forward, uh, uh, how can we make sure that there's a win-win outcome uh, for the, the recipient country of the infrastructure project? Thank you very much. Uh, we understand in order to promote economic development, it's vital for us to prepare very good projects. We should have bankable projects, well prepared, and implement it most cost effectively and by a high level of standard, particularly with regard to environmental protection and taking care of the people who would uh, be displaced by these kind of infrastructure projects. So first of all, how can we identify very good projects? It depends certainly on the actual situations of the countries in which the AIIB or other multilateral development institutions finances those projects. We in Asia are actually awash in liquidity, but we are lacking any kind of mechanism to recycle all these financial resources. This could be done by a new bank, AIB, as well as by the existing institutions. The important thing for us to work on the ground, to work with the project sponsors and uh, probably with the support of the sovereign governments, 
to propel bankable projects. Because I think a very good project should start from the very beginning in its conceptualization. And we can certainly help improve the project preparation. But I think it's very much important for the project sponsors, the local community, to be actively involved. Without their participation, without their contribution, it is not possible for any bank to do a good job in implementing the project. And once the project is done, throughout the whole life cycle, it's also very important for us to ensure smooth operation. That, in my view, is the standard we are talking about. So when we talk about a standard for having a very good project, does not mean the preparation, does not mean we simply take care of the environment or displace the people. I think it covers the whole life cycle of a project. Um, based on experience um, of the existing MDBs and also existing experience of the borrowing countries, we, we think we are on a very good uh, uh, platform. But of course, over these years, the institutional capability of the borrowing countries in Asia certainly have improved a lot, but there's still a big gap. I think particularly in some of the low-income countries. And you don't do the project in the same one, the same place. You move around. You move from rich areas to uh, low-income areas. And then it, you have the issue, you have the difficulty of building the local capacity. So we, we think it's very much important for us to reach out to all of the people, all of the interested parties, making sure a project could be successful. So um, we need to work with the existing MDBs. We need to work with the bilateral donors, investors. And uh, uh, Mr. Watanabe-san, you know, we've been friends for so many years. And I think uh, in, a, in Asia's development, we can also work together. And we, we have already been um, uh, approached by the World Bank, ADB, and they are very generous in offering assistance to us in this stage of preparation. So the outsiders may not understand what's happening. Let me tell you, we've been working very well. When we have the workshop in Beijing uh, last, last month, the World Bank experts came to offer experience about the safeguard policies, environmental social framework. So we have benefited from enormous support from the World Bank ADB and other partners. So we are very much confident. But ultimately, I would say, it is, the, it is the responsibility of the sovereign governments and the private sector companies also to work closely with the multilateral institutions to make sure we really have high quality investment projects. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, any more questions? Okay, I think it's time to conclude our discussion. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My name is Piyush Gupta from DBS Bank. Uh, several references have been made since the morning to the uh, opportunity and need for greater integration of the financial uh, and capital markets. Uh, as a banker in the region for the last 30 years, uh, I have to say I'm not sanguine about the prospects at all. Uh, and in fact, in the last decade, I would argue that we have slid backwards as opposed to move forward. Uh, and I want to make uh, three observations. One, uh, the entire regulatory regime and agenda in the last several years after the financial crisis uh, has been driven off of the back of a very Western agenda. Uh, excesses in the financial markets in uh, Europe and the US have caused the need for a regulatory framework uh, which uh, uh, causes for tightening up those markets. That's not our agenda. In most of Asia, the markets are underdeveloped. And if anything, we need deeper and richer markets as opposed to smaller and more constrained markets. Nevertheless, uh, we have not used the opportunity to create an Asian voice uh, and have continued to uh, uh, follow a prescription driven from the West. So it's a squandered opportunity, if nothing else. Uh, second observation, in fact, uh, by continuing to uh, follow some of the Western norms on these issues, we've actually taken a downward step 
which is a lot of ring fencing in our region. In fact, in many ways, our markets are more fragmented today because of ring fencing of liquidity, ring fencing of uh, money supplies, ring fencing of capital than they used to be. So we've take, gone backward. And finally, as you look forward, in our industry, perhaps the most biggest opportunity and the biggest need is in the back of the digital economy. The availability of information and data can profoundly change how our industry uh, works. Uh, in reality, the fences around information and data uh, in Asia have only risen. It is extremely difficult to see a regime where information sharing is easy, uh, where ring fencing around data does not exist. So my question is really to two uh, people on the panel, uh, Mr. Wahid, not in your current hat, but in your pri ex-private sector hat as a colleague from Maybank. Uh, and then uh, uh, Mr. Chidambaram, uh, from a public sector perspective, how do the two of you think about what could we do in Asia to really do something substantial about changing this and creating some more integrated financial market structures? Okay. Thank you. Maybe I can start first, uh, yes. Misu. Uh, thank you, Peach, for those comments. Um, you know, it's been almost two years since I left um, the banking sector. Um, but we all remember those days uh, we were working very much um, together uh, with the central banks uh, towards the creation of the ASEAN Banking Integration Framework uh, alongside the other initiatives uh, undertaken by the respective uh, Securities Commission uh, across ASEAN countries. Uh, now, it's been a long journey, but um, I'm actually very uh, happy that um, at the last ASEAN Finance Ministers meeting and the Central Bank uh, Governors meeting, uh, held in Kuala Lumpur, uh, this was uh, just a few weeks ago, um, that the ASEAN Banking Integration Framework uh, has been uh, endorsed. And uh, I think what uh, needs to be done now is actually to follow through and execute them. Um, I, uh, in my opening remarks earlier, uh, I made specific mention about the his agreement signed between Bank Negara Malaysia, uh, Bank Indonesia, and uh, the Autoritas uh, Jasa Kewangan uh, from Indonesia. Uh, that will pave the way uh, for uh, the presence of uh, Indonesian banks uh, in Malaysia. So obviously th there is that concept of uh, mutual recognition be uh, being uh, encouraged uh, and I, I do look forward uh, to Bank Mandiri uh, opening up uh, their branches uh, in Malaysia uh, because I do believe that if you truly, uh, if you truly want uh, an integrated um, region, uh, an integrated economy, you do need the presence of uh, one country's bank uh, into the other parts of ASEAN uh, that will then help facilitate uh, better movement of uh, capital and, and clientele and uh, business dealings uh, across uh, the uh, ASEAN countries. Um, I know the, the journey has been um, relatively slow in the past, uh, but uh, to be able to uh, arrive at where we are today, I think that's been a significant movement. So uh, again, uh, I do look forward to uh, DBS, OCBC, UOB uh, alongside uh, Maybank and CIMB uh, and alongside uh, banks from uh, Philippines and Bank Mandiri, uh, BC and so on, uh, operating into each other's uh, country and thus uh, facilitating a greater flow of uh, trade uh, and business. And uh, if I may say, um, there's been a lot of comments about uh, the reservation um, by some countries and so on. My view is that um, in the past, uh, many of these initiatives have been very much driven by the uh, politicians. Um, the time has come for the private sector uh, and uh, for the people uh, to actually demand their respective uh, governments uh, to pursue uh, economic integration uh, further. Because at the end of the day, uh, when we talk about e economic integration, it's all about the continuous uh, prosperity uh, in our, the economy, uh, which will then translate into uh, better business opportunities for the people and better employment opportunities uh, for the people. So it, it must therefore uh, go back to the concept of uh, a people-centered ASEAN uh, that will help drive uh, further integration. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it seems that all our speakers uh, agree more or less uh, with uh, broader Asian regionalism, but caution that we need to overcome the strategic mistrust that has shrouded us uh, until today. Um, it goes without saying that Asia welcomes bolder region-wide initiatives and uh, projects to create a sense of interdependence. Increasing interdependence will help 
overcome the lingering mistrust and misperception, and make it harder for any one country to take a confrontational approach on its own. In talking about Asian regionalism, the biggest question mark is that to what extent we can form the Asian identity and leave behind age-old rivalry and hatred. There is a positive role to play for outside powers, like US and EU, in helping with this economic integration. For that, they must engage with Asian countries, recognizing shifting configuration of power on the ground. That's all for our discussion today. Let's proud again for our distinguished guests for sharing their insights with us. Thank you.